represents thir three fourths of the direct investment in the world. Everything that we can contribute with to pro provide foreseeability, predictability, and the rule of law, governance, and in the decrease the cost of capital will encourage companies from all these 35 countries from the OECD to invest in Argentina in a sustainable manner. One of the projects has to do with the transference of policies of, politi of public purchasings. The PPP programs that the government has for the next year. Will the practices from the OECD be applied before these bidding processes? We are doing this already. We are not awaiting for joining the OECD to start applying the best practices, which is very relevant to have the approval of the National Congress about the criminal responsibility uh, law for companies. Uh, this is very much related to companies. We cannot have a system of competencies if we are penalizing the physical persons and not the legal persons. This is already happening. There is a, an important program by, led by the Ministry of Modernization in our country that has to do with opening all of the information, disseminating all the public purchasing information uh, for the population, everything that has to do with transparency and public integrity, all bidding processes that the government is undertaking. Not only PPPs, which are 50 projects, but with the most ambitious infrastructure plan, it's online. All of the information is online, open, all the rules are known by all members. As San Antonio said at the beginning, in the case of Bidding processes for renewable energies, this allow the cost of energy to decrease 30% in less than a year by this conjunction of factors, public integrity, transparency, fighting corruption, open government, and in a general way, the process that Argentina is undergoing to join the OECD. Argentina is not the only country in Latin America trying to join the OECD. Also, Peru and Brazil are under process. How do you see this higher interest in the region to reach the multilateral bodies. And what do you see for the elections in the next coming year for this trend in the region? I think we need to separate the short term for the, from the long term. In the Latin American region, we have the opportunity of creating an area that is fully aligned with the best practices of the OECD. Mexico was the first country to be member of the OECD, then Chile joined in. Colombia is very close. Colombia is also a candidate. We have Argentina, Peru, and Brazil that are candidates to become members. Therefore, the greatest dream uh, from the Argentinian administration is that in 10 years' time, we can have seven countries from Latin America as OECD members. This will create the most important region after Europe that is aligned with these best practices. And these best practices, it's from the economic point of view, social point of view, institutional point of view, and this will create progress. And this will be progress for the population. The ultimate goal, and it is good to highlight this, is that Latin America is one of the areas with the highest levels of poverty, but also with the greatest inequalities of the world. So the ultimate goal is to have an integrated Latin America to the best practices of the OECD. It's precisely this, to create this uh, richness, that it's inclusive, and that this allows the continent to get a qualitative leap. So and how the OECD can have tools to refound Europe so that the OECD can also refound Latin America for the next generations. I think we still have time for one question from the audience or two, in case we have them. Mientras lo piensan, te tengo... As they think about it, I have one question. At mid-year, the OECD did a review with some comments for the country. One of the ones that was mentioned was the high fiscal deficit among many of the ones that you mentioned. So what were the impact of these comments for the roadmap for next year? 
that is, in 2018, what are the things that we should pay attention to so as to have these accessions to the OECD? In the OECD published for the first time an economic report on Argentina. That was the first time we had this report for the country, and the first time the OECD carried out this study for a non-member country and that is not in a formal process of accession. So this was not only an economic uh, study, but it was a multidimensional study. We were for 10 months uh, working with the experts of the OECD, not only working on macroeconomic issues, but also on health, education, energy, infrastructure. I always say that in order for a country to be able to grow sustainably, there's a need for social investment. You can have some macroeconomic uh, changes, the fiscal policy, the monetary policy, the economic policy, but if you don't invest on health, education, infrastructure, energy, the growth can just last three, four years, and then we are stagnant. So here the challenge is not to grow for four years, but to grow for decades. And in this uh, study uh, by the OECD, the 13, the 35 member countries, they, uh, we had a two-day examination, and with these 35 uh, member countries, and uh, we had the Foreign Affairs Ministry, the Ministry of Labour, Education. And uh, from an economic perspective, they did uh, several recommendations. And these are the recommendations that we have started to implement. We haven't waited a long time to launch the fiscal reform in order to reduce the tax uh, load on production and uh, employment, but also to eliminate those distortive uh, taxes in a progressive way, like the stamp tax or the gross income tax. and. The pension uh, reform that is very important in order to assure um, the system and also th the reform so that Argentina has its employees under the formal system. Today, 30% of the economy is under the counter in the informal sector because uh, workers do not have social insurance. They do not contribute for the future pensions. So therefore, this roadmap that has been uh, started by Congress in the last few days is part of this work with the OECD. And the most importantly, the OECD uh, put a stress on the quality of our educational and health systems. So therefore, the reforms that can be done from a macroeconomic point of view have an impact, but they have an impact in the short term. Here, the important thing is that the reforms can be long lasting and that they allow us, like it happened in the, in the, in the 80s, and I don't mean in 1980s, but in the previous century. That was the last generation that thought of our country in the long term so that we can have the basics and the pillars that allows us to grow for decades and not, not just for a couple of years. Thank you very much, Marcelo. Thank you. Once again, uh, good morning. I'm uh, from Magazine Apertura. It's a pleasure to be here today. I thank uh, the Council for inviting us and, above all, to talk about something 
that we're all fascinating to be able to go through this stage of Argentina reinserting to the world. And in this case, with a panel that can talk about Argentina reinserting to the uh, global business world, that was a stage, as the minister put it, of 15 years or over 15 years. Uh, in which Argentina was quite left out of the business world. So I would like to introduce the panel that we have here. To the right, we have Lorena Zika. She's general manager of Intel Argentina. She joined Intel in 2013. And as of 2015, she is general manager of the local operation. And as of 2016, she leads the sales segment in the public sector in Latin America. Before, she also worked for Akron, BenQ, Prima, and AMD. And recently, she was recognized as a, with a distinction or award of Women to Watch Argentina 2017. And then we have Guillermo Villarrosas. Guillermo is a director of Arcor Group, and he joined the group in 1996. And uh, he was one of the main figures uh, regarding the merger of Bagley and Danone in Latin America. And he also uh, occupied the CEO of Bagley Latin America, reporting directly to the board Arco Danone from 2005 and 2015. As of 2015, he is member of the Administration Council of Bagley and Arcor. And he, here we have Gustavo Burkovic. He is uh, from uh, maker McKenzie, and he uh, uh, supervises as a member of the administration council, and he's also an uh, expert on mergers and acquisitions, and he is a member of Latin America M&A and Private Equity Steering Committee from Baker McKenzie. So uh, he is expert in mergers, spin-offs, and reorganizations. So thank the three of you for being here. The idea with this panel is to talk about certain topics. How we are today regarding doing business in Argentina. Then what we have touched upon several times this day, and maybe it's the most important thing for the business community, and this is the reforms being implemented in the second stage in Argentina. Investments would be the third topic, and then we would close with the idea of how is Argentina entering the Latin America business world, and how to what extent Argentina could be a leading model, as Secretary Albright put it, Argentina uh, in the business sector for the region and for the world. So if you agree, we would. Uh, I would like to start off by you conveying to the audience what is your perception, your views as to what is doing business like uh, in Argentina. And the World Bank has just issued uh, a report about doing business in Argentina 2017. And Argentina, as you must have read, is in position 117 out of 190 countries. So the not so strong point is precisely taxes. That's the heaviest load from the local economy. However, two very strong positive points are access to credit and the protection of investors. So that could uh, set us into space. So Lorena, would you like to start? Yes. Uh, apologies for my voice. I promise not to sing. So how is it to do business in Argentina? Well, uh, for multinational companies as ours with operations in over 120 countries, all countries have their own complexities and challenges. And I think that the responsibility of the companies is to adapt to the challenges posed by each country. In terms of what the changes that we have detected in the last few years, I would divide them in two. On one hand, we have at a micro level, what was the direct impact on the business, on the market? In the technology segment, just to give you an idea, this year, year after year, the retail segment, uh, when we sold uh, PCs, it grew by 55%. This is a concrete number. Uh, prices of computers were reduced. I think that everybody knows that. So therefore, the average ticket also grew. And this has to do with uh, capabilities and the possibilities that consumers have 
regarding having access to better technology, better prices, so as to play in a more competitive market. And from a macroeconomic level that is for the long term, I think the most interesting aspect would be, and I think as an IT company, we are in a privileged position because we are able to be in a country in which technology is understood as an essential basis to grow and to develop the country. And you also lay the foundations and to open this dialogue between the private and public sector in which companies can be part of this dialogue. We can contribute with good practices we can propose. I think that those would be the highlights of the last few years. Those would be the most interesting aspects. Guillermo, Arcor is one of the two uh, most important multinational com companies in Latin America. Uh, you invoice the turnover is $3.2 million, I think, and the main uh, sector is a candy, and you're strong in the dairy market as well. So how did you go uh, about in the last few years the change of the environment, uh, the business environment in Argentina? Well, there was a deep and radical change with this new administration. Now we have an agenda that it's a pro-market agenda. There's no more overdone interventionism on behalf of the state, a public uh, sector in companies. Now prices are set by the competition and not by the government. And um, Companies are not seen with fear. Now they are fostered, encouraged in order to invest. There's a huge objective of uh, organizing and putting macroeconomic in order. And I think that the most relevant aspect is that the agenda that the government has in these transformations that they're implementing and that they are uh, their goal are the, the businessmen themselves. That is, the logistical costs that put a constraint in the growth or maybe the social uh, insurance distortive uh, taxes, everything that was very well mentioned by Minister Cabrera, and it's the people themselves who need the business sector in order to continue to grow. So the environment is very positive. I think we need to have the necessary patience so that these can be achieved and implemented. There's a turning point right now with all the laws that have been uh, passed by the government, and we are optimistic. Okay. Well, I would like to give some context uh, the current moment, because sometimes we get very anxious and we lose sight where we're coming from. When we talk about investment, I work a lot with foreign investment, and many of the investors were in Argentina in 2001, and they were in Argentina in 2009, 2015, and then we had the uh, elections with uh, a great enthusiasm. Now, after these experiences and in the political context that was received by this administration, it was logical for any, uh, any one of us who could have uh, made an analysis of when the investment would come, that everybody would have waited for the midterm elections. And this is what, in fact, happened. The initial enthusiasm turned into a more concrete, specific interest. Then uh, they waited until the elections. The elections came by. And now this needs to start, as everybody expects. Some very positive steps that I highlight in our daily current interaction is that we have some tools that uh, make it faster or agile, even though it may be an anecdote. But they are taken into account, as Minister Cabrera mentioned. 
there's uh, new uh, ways of um, uh, corporations, like simplified corporations. And this is an agile way in which you can uh, work from a juridical point of view. And, and you can have uh, limited uh, responsibility corporate, and you can just have your tax identification number in one day. So there's a lot of things that made bureaucracy more agile. Of course, the economic context needs to help. But this is the time in which we should start seeing the uh, potential for investment the region has. So first for you and then for the rest. But what is missing in order to do more business in Argentina yet? Well, along the lines, uh, uh, I think that what is still missing is that everybody believes that this is the path that we're starting today will be sustainable. And the ultimate test would be uh, when uh, government from the opposition right now sustains the road or 10 variables or the rules of the game that can be long lasting, that we should have feasibility. When What do we mean by this? When a customer asks us, okay, what will this, this is the problem, what will happen? What will the judge say? What will the government say? Well, in Argentina, there's a pendulous between one administration and the next, so it's a huge difference. Unless we can reduce this uh, pendulous to the ones of a normal country, well, this is what's missing. And in order to get there, we need time mainly. And then it's a daily situation and context that maybe could help us make a more agile investment. I think that the Argentina has entered a path that if it can sustain it and project credibility that this will be sustained, we will have many years of investment. Now, Guillermo, before talking about the current stage of the second stage of reforms implemented by uh, the Macri's administration. So the first line is to just order the scenario that is to put an end with the uh, financial isolation and commercial isolation and to tackle mostly inflation. Now, within this spectrum, from this point of view, what do you think that needs to be reinforced? Inflation is dropping. Is it dropping enough? Or do you have patience to wait? Or how would you uh, help this? Well, no. Inflation is dropping, yes, and that's evident. Inflation is a consequence of an increase of cost. And um, in the salary negotiations that will take place next year, this uh, will also play a part if uh, we can, uh, well, of course, everything needs time. And once again, I think that this is the right path. And this is supported by the society, both uh, as it was in the elections, as I hope it will be in the next elections of 2019. It's a permanent reformism, uh, for, uh, the one of the government, but we need to give it time. If this continues, there's a factor that's subjective, right? And that is expectations. When the population has good expectations of growth, consumption grows. And consumption has changed from September to nowadays at these massive consumptions. Uh, other sectors have had a faster benefit, like the construction sector or public works, the energy sector, and so forth. But in massive consumption, we started to notice a change in September. This change continues. And these changes, based on the purchasing uh, power of people and expectations. So what we um, see is that we will we'll have elements that will favor job creations like public works. And on the other hand, the second part of uh, uh, rates and tariff adjustments will reduce the purchasing power. But I think that the, ba in the balance will be a moderate and positive growth. And that complemented by, I hope, the expectations of people that can realize that this is a sustainable uh, path in time that will be fruitful. And this will uh, end up in a greater consumption and more jobs. In the case of technology, Lorena, this is a separate case. As uh, Guillermo very well put it, consumption 
had a, a recovery this year. It was uh, kind of like slow last year, and this year it's trying to recover lost uh, ground. And as Guillermo put it, the idea is that this grows next year. Now, in the case of technology, it has grown. And for those who do not know uh, Argentina, Argentina is in a, a privileged situation. It's almost zero unemployment, and companies are sort of like stealing talents from one another. And also something that not everybody knows. It's a second currency uh, generator of Argentina after the farming sector. In 2015, they exported services for 3.3 or $2 billion. In that case, you you are doing business almost at a bulk level. But n nevertheless, is there anything that is of your concern and that you would like to reinforce this trend next year? Yes, I think that the most important of all this is education, that is to prepare the environment uh, and to prepare the skills of uh, people. Because the truth is that technology is changing day after day. The only thing that is constant in technology is change. So technology is changing. This is why we do not talk about technology as of one PC or technology is not something that belongs to an engineer. It just cross cuts everyone. So we have to be prepared for this, for new opportunities. We need to be prepared to position ourselves with all these talents that you were mentioned as a country that can deliver value and that can um, create these valuable solutions. This is what will create the impact, the greatest impact by 2025. Companies will have an average of two years of life for when today, uh, 12 years of life, and when today they last like 60 years. So this means that we will have to deliver new solutions to new problems. So we need to prepare the ecosystem, the consumer, but most important, we need to prepare the skills or the capabilities of all these people that will be creating all these changes. So we have to say that. The government last year implemented certain laws, the SMEs and the Entrepreneurial Law or Act, so as to take advantage of all this entrepreneurial enrichment of Argentina and technology. Now, having said this, I would like to go maybe to the second block, and this is the reforms that are being debated today in Congress. And that this is a triple reform, the labor reform, the tax reform and the pension reforms. So this would be the access so as to lay the foundations and to fix the foundations, strengthen the foundations um, so as to keep on working. Uh, now, Gustavo, from a point of view of foreign investors, do they think or do they convey to you uh, like can, can this be implemented all in once? That is, these three reforms that are massive reforms that in some countries, like for example, the fiscal reform would take one or two years to be negotiated and to be uh, passed. Uh, so what do, you, what do investors think? Could this be done in this short time, like four months' time? I couldn't tell you what investors think in that respect, if the three reforms won or when. What we do notice is that investors uh, consider that there's not so many options for Argentina in terms of the reforms. If Argentina really wants to attract investment, not only the government uh, is convinced about this, but also the opposition, there's a lot of conditioning uh, for, in terms of competitiveness and a region uh, that lead Argentina to go through these kind of reforms. If we analyze the region, Colombia, Peru, Brazil itself lately, or Chile, these are the countries that compete in the region for the same investors. They have labor costs that are lower, and some have tax costs that are also lower. Therefore, we will not have a lot of success in attracting investments unless we align this cost. An example I always give is the anti-corruption issue, and the undersecretary mentioned this when he talked about the OECD. We uh, look for investors who come from origin countries that have a strong anti-corruption laws in their countries and that they are applied in the destination countries. If Argentina does not adopt a set of anti-corruption laws that are aligned 
with the worldwide legislation, it will not be a destination for investment. And I think that this is seen by investors. Investors uh, trust the, the fact that the reforms will be passed sooner or later, better or worse. So I don't see this as a great obstacle for investment. I think the uh, most important obstacle for investors in the context I mentioned before is to project credibility and sustainability in the path that has been chosen. Now, in the food industry, what would be of these three reforms, the one that would allow you to boost your business, the tax reform, the pension reform, the labor reform? I imagine your answer, but you, you tell me. We have to differentiate the impact that it could this could have uh, domestically and in, in the international market. These reforms would allow to expand the international market uh, more because of the competitiveness. Obviously, in our case, for instance, uh, in the case of Arcor, uh, we do not have so many problems until the exit of the factory in terms of productivity. Of course, we can improve it, but in any of the markets that we are involved. But from that point onwards, if you add the cost of the freight and on the distortive taxes and the costs at the harbors and ports, etc., cetera, uh, of course, again, well, the labor costs, salaries, well, in that sense, we lose competitiveness. And I cannot speak on behalf of every company, but many companies, just to mention Techin, for instance, that are very competitive at a worldwide level. So these reforms, once they are implemented, fully implemented, they will have a very positive effect. We export to over 100 countries, 120 countries. And obviously, we are not in the, our best of times in terms of competitiveness. But this is a policy the company always had. And due to many reasons, many times it's a very good business. It's a source of uh, currency income. Sometimes when you cannot have access to currencies, this is not the case in the future, the nearby future, that is. But it updates us. It's like being open to the words, because if you have to export to China, to the US, well, you need to have a level of quality and a level of productivity that is very important. So these reforms will be able to achieve that part of a business. It will make us more competitive, and we will grow uh, domestically. Arcor has already made important investment in the last few years because we're optimistic in terms of the future. And then this will allow to improve our turnover uh, for 2021. And we are also seeing that there are international investors that are approaching for certain sectors, since Arcor has agribusiness and packaging and different areas. So they approach us to develop um, uh, products of a high added value in which Arcor or the country uh, has these comparative advantages of sun, soil, etc. So we could add more value in order to export products that are currently being imported. I'm not going to mention which ones, but okay, you cannot tell us the product or the companies, but we're, we're where are they coming from? What's the, the sectors? You invested in packaging and in uh, dairy and uh, milk market, yes. Uh, proteins uh, that they want to develop uh, in corn. But you will never get out from the agribusiness sectors, right? Because there are certain companies that maybe they started off with from technology, they went to the food industry. So could you? picture, well, now you're going to renewable energy, but can you picture yourself getting out from the target or the branch that you're working out, like go to renewable energies, for instance, because the government created a lot of uh, incentives for that? Yes, well, in biomass energy, for instance, yes, we have a sugar mill and they manufacture um, bagasse and we are creating electricity, but we could use it for fuel. So we're always open to opportunities. And the, the group is known because of our candies, but really uh, 
candy is less than 25% of our production. There's lots of other categories and products that maybe are not so well known, but yes, we are open to new opportunities. The energy sector is one of them. Lorena, in the case of Intel, what is the vision that you have that is of being uh, like the voice of a multinational company uh, of what Argentina is, and uh, especially considering these reforms? Well, we're super optimistic. I think that everything that was discussed today, everything that creates a context of clarity and uh, feasibility, predictability, gives uh, more confidence to local companies and international companies, even when we talk about uh, gradualism, if it should be more or less gradual. Well, of course, there's subtleties and different levels. If it's forever gradual, it will never be useful. And if it happens too fast, well, it's easy come, easy go. So it's not useful. Uh, either. So I think that all measures that are taken in order to improve the different positions, so to create more consumption, better labor stability, or better uh, conditions for companies, will attract further investment. Also, considering the entrepreneurship, I think that there's a lot of measures that are being taken and a lot of reforms. Uh, in order to create uh, better conditions for entrepreneurs, and this would be an engine for growth. Gustavo, in terms of competitiveness, is this a claim, a requirement that is evident, but that is growing maybe in terms of intensity uh, from local companies and from foreign investors? Uh, so. How important is competitiveness um, regarding a uh, high uh, labor cost or a tax load in Latin America? Well, yes, that's an issue. It's an issue for the initial time as to when investments will start. We work with uh, investors in the long term, not with a Chinese mentality in such a long term, but yes, they are long-term investors. These are not financial investors, but more strategic investors, uh, long-term investors. So therefore, this is a complaint of theirs, obviously, and especially all the bureaucracy, the red tape, uh, labor issues, well, these are uh, heavy loads. And this is why uh, we have uh, so important uh, labor departments at legal firms. So this is something that they all suffer, they all complain about. So in the long term, as I said, having these reforms here on the table, and if we can go more in depth, well, I think that the interest uh, comes with optimism. There's uh, interest that will turn into concrete action, uh, more applied. So if we can sustain these reforms in time, then, uh, well, this is the view of investors. But yes, I agree with you today. The logistic, the logistic cost is huge, still huge. And this is why we, we have all this infrastructure plan that is very encouraging. Uh, do you have a figure of how much the logistical cost is? No, no, but maybe Guillermo knows about it. Uh, what is the impact of the logistic cost? Well, it's very, very strong impact. For instance, if we talk about uh, tomatoes, uh, tomato sauce, we export it and now we have the import because we're importing tomato-based products in a country that has all the conditions to be highly productive in terms of tomatoes. So we study these really in depth. And Italian people, for instance, they have a very good uh, productivity. And we have replicated this here. But the logistical cost is 22% of the cost, if we talk about tomatoes. That these tomatoes are manufactured in the province of San Juan. So with that, we are left out of the game in order to keep on exporting. Now, of course, if all these changes are achieved, then we will be back again in the international market in order to export. And an issue that was fostered by the reforms, and here I include all the reforms, or the ones of the first stage and this of the second stage, is that they facilitated the entry, and we had discussed this with Secretary Albright at one point yesterday, the Asian 
uh, investors, particularly Chinese investors. So how uh, do your companies position with this new player uh, that is doing very fast, that is, they, they execute the investment very fast when others are just analyzing or waiting. Well, they are part of the ecosystems. That's a true here and in the rest of the countries are, as well. It's This is true, and, and what I think is that most affects us is that Maybe they have a short-term investment plan. This is not good. Doesn't matter what is the origin of this investment, China, from China or France or whatever. But if a Chinese company enters the market as part of the ecosystems and they add value, well, I don't think that's a threat. I do believe that in in the case of IT in Argentina, uh, specifically local companies with the previous regulations, maybe they had a different uh, business format or they had a different relevance. Well, today they have to reassess and we have to help them so as to see how they include these new players to these ecosystems and how they can capitalize on the incomes. But I think that this is part of the competition and this is healthy and it is useful and it will be useful for consumers above all. And what about Arcor's perspective? How do you envision this? Well, as we said before, China is the greatest world investor, right? And I think that they invest beyond the administrations or the governments in office. And here we have examples in Argentina because they have a strategic patience. <laughs> so they wait for many years. So this is a structural investment. So within their plan, within their business plan as a country, well, they have it. In our case, we do not foresee uh, investment in the food sector from China. We see this more as a, an opportunity when we have enough competitiveness. In fact, we are already exporting to China. and. It's a quite a complex situation because to achieve a distribution in China is not easy. There's a lot of consumers, but it's very difficult to reach them unless you associate to, with a Chinese company. You also have to stockpile the products and so forth. All the, But we are there. We will continue to be there. There are products that Arcor and Argentina, well, we have competitive uh, products like uh, dairy-based products, like uh, milk-based uh, candy, or the famous bonobon, uh, it's like a chocolate uh, candy. They consume it a lot in China. And uh, there are countries that they consume per capita more than in Argentina. So. We keep uh, having our presence in those markets, and we will revisit when we will be more competitive. In the case of investors, can do you feel at Baker and McKenzie that there's such a strong Chinese uh, presence in uh, south of Argentina? There's maybe a lot of uh, producers that bring the components and they just put it together here or in the energy sector. How do you feel this? Well, yes, uh, China as an investment country, well, they have been here for a, a while and they're here to stay. And we uh, learn to work with them. It's a different culture. It's a different mindset. And what's the difference? Well, in the objectives, a short, medium, or long-term objectives, the, uh, the awareness of cost is totally different. And the private profile, I would say, that a non-Chinese investor has uh, against a more bureaucratic profile or public sector more profile, even though it's a private company from China, we all know what they are like. So it's a different criteria, different profile. Uh, even in within uh, one group of dele delegations, there's a whole hierarchy. So it's just an investor as any other. So we adapt and we try to learn how to work with them. And they invest in many, many sectors. 
with a very strategic uh, vision of what they do. OK, and now we go to the next topic, that's investment. That's your main topic. It's estimated that Argentina should need nine billion dollars of investments in order to keep a cycle of growth that is sustainable. Now, in spite of the reforms that we just mentioned, what other conditions do you see or uh, investors, uh, foreign investors see, those who work with Baker and McKenzie, in order to keep this constant flow? We talked about this reign of investors at one point. Well, first, we need to have macroeconomic conditions and they need to exist in order to the investments to happen. And second, a plan that could be sustained with the reforms already implemented or not. But we need a plan that needs to be sustainable and foreseeable and that you need to sustain it. And do you see this plan already implemented? Well, I think there's this idea of a country that it's different to the one we had before 2015, that this goes hand in hand with the insertion of Argentina in the world and that, well, market economies have to do with it. I think that Argentina is becoming a normal country. Or it's along those lines and therefore we can take advantage of the competitive and competitive advantages uh, against the rest. It's very difficult to think that the provinces alone can attract investment. Uh, the truth is that the capital city is a black hole here in Buenos Aires. So you need to create all these incentives so that the provinces can also compete. There's a topic that uh, was discussed a lot at the beginning of Macri's administration. That's a claim of juridical security. How much do you think this sensation improved, that now we have this legal uh, uh, security? Well, in terms of the sensation, it improved a lot. I don't know. Uh, Argentina, as of the 90s up to, up to today, it was like a law enforcement jurisdiction. Uh, so that sensation changed. And I think that the comment is very good because this is one of the most important challenges that Argentina has to establish, and it was mentioned here, the rule of law several times. And this needs to be a mandate, uh, uh, an, an agreement. I was at a conference of Judge Moro, and they talked about uh, certain agreements that many countries have. Well, democracy is one, so we need to have these agreements that are not debatable. So, and in, from an economic point of view, and from a rule of law point of view, there's certain things that shouldn't be discussed, like anti-corruption or anti-inflation. So this is perceived by investors very fast. So, Lorena. What do you think? I definitely adhere to what he was saying. It is important as well to accompany us from Argentina as a country with everything that has to do with infrastructure and communications and guaranteeing a plan for the long term that's related to a state policy and not just a program or a plan, because if it's a state policy, you can assume that there is a long term project. and I won't be something that's implemented for a year or two. That provides legal framework as well, and regulations and a standardized framework for companies to invest and project here growth in Argentina. I was a few months ago at a Smart Cities event. We were talking about Smart Cities. What about them? The Buenos Aires City has a project to become the smartest city in Latin America. That's a plan of the mayor. That has not only to do with luminaires being smart or connected transport, it has to do with connectivity and infrastructure that accompanies. It entails a plan and investment generating a social impact, environmental impact, economic impact in the intelligent cities, smart cities. They do generate economic social impact. They capture new capitals, new investors, uh, capture talents. It should be part of the plan. And I believe it is being part of the plan and the conversation, which is uh, very relevant. Guillermo, we mentioned macro stability that is trying to be generated by means of restructural 
reforms, leaving the macro aspect and looking at the value chain of ARCOR, a very long value chain with representations abroad. What is the current weight, and the minister was talking about this, the impact of the SMEs, small and medium enterprises, the, what's the impact of micro stability for them? And how do you see that in your macro aspects? Does it require more? What else should be done in this regard? Well, as consumption grows, SMEs will grow accordingly. There are certain limitations for SMEs, like what? One is access to financial costs. Large companies can fund themselves abroad at a lot more affordable rates. But a small and medium enterprise needs to do this locally at rates that currently are, have an impact at the cost until this changes. So access to credit, if there is a way to finance SMEs in a more competitive manner, this will be an advantage for sure. Large companies that will be reflected in all these smaller companies for any kind of industry. So we need to start wrapping up. I have a question for the three of you, so you can give your opinion. At one of the panels, the word gradualism was mentioned. In the Argentine uh, economy, the dichotomy was gradualism and or shock. And we all agreed that gradualism is the only way forward. How do you see about it? As from your sector, Gustavo was from the investors. Do they understand, investors, that gradualism is the only way to go through this? difficult times in the case of consumption. Is there uh, patience to go through it? And in the case of the technological business, isn't this a hurdle? Of course, if Minister Cabrera mentioned the size of the state in the G terms of the GDP, you can only think of gradualism. An immediate result would be a disaster. And Argentina had tried all sorts of diets with rebound effects in the last 20 years. It's more a mediatic issue than an actual one, I believe. Gustavo. Guillermo. There are limitations, not only economic limitations, but also political ones, human and social limitations mainly that I don't see how you, one could apply a shock policy. Uh, Minister Cabrera said they have no control or they have a minority in uh, the Congress, both chambers. It will be very difficult with everything that we have ahead from the electoral point of view not to apply this gradually with a lack of consciousness. In the case of technology, as you say, Gradualism can have an impact in the delay or the time that the latest technology will take to arrive to the country. But I believe definitely it's the best of ways. A shock would be a catastrophe. But I think that with everything, the gradualism should not be eternal. And to have a visibility of when things will happen. If we have a calendar about when things will happen, doesn't matter how long it will take, you can plan ahead more clearly. I already mentioned permanent reformism. This is a matter of waves, and it should be continued and correcting all the misarrangements that we have structurally. So gradualism and permanent reformism, that is a model that Argentina can take to the region first and then to the world, This is pos showing that this is possible. Before closing this panel, I will open up for questions, if any, from the audience. No questions? There is one over there. Hello. Good morning. I would like to ask the person from ARCOR talking about logistics. Do you have an idea of how to go about it? 
that is, we've heard from years about uh, logistics, but I don't see it being resolved or sorted out in practical terms. Well, infrastructure, railroads, highways, bureaucracy, all the paperwork, and the ports. The port is very expensive in relation to ports in Latin America. So port related costs. The government is working on that. I don't have the specific agenda with the details, but the government took notice of this. And not only that, it made that objective its own. So I understand it will move forward as gradually as it can. The sooner, the better. With that uh, gradualism, that will be the sooner, the better to reach good port. I want to thank the panel for this discussion, for their insights. Now I give the floor to Minister Jorge Fauri, Minister of Foreign Affairs and Worship from Argentina. Hello again, everybody. And this has been an absolutely um, terrific discussion, and I really would like to express my appreciation to all of our speakers and panelists for providing such incredible insights. And I, I really do want to tell you how proud I am of the Atlantic Council and to thank the team, Jason Marchek and Sean Miner and Roberta Braga, for all the work that it goes into preparing this kind of an event. I will report to Washington to say you did a great job. <laughs> uh, uh, um, our conference today really has uh, underscored that this is a truly exciting time for Argentina, and it also has to be an incredibly busy time for the government from everything that we have uh, learned today. So I'm especially grateful that our next speaker has made time in his very busy schedule to be here with us. Jorge Fowey has served as Argentina's Minister of Foreign Affairs and Worship since June. Let me tell you, being foreign minister is a great job. Um, I, uh, he is a distinguished member of Argentina's Foreign Service since 1975, and Minister Fowey has represented Argentina abroad in important countries in this hemisphere, including Brazil, Chile, and Venezuela. He is also uh, held very important positions within the foreign ministry, including National Director of Ceremonies and Director of Mercosur. And most recently, he served as Argentina's ambassador to Portugal and to France. So he has a very deep understanding of the Atlantic community and the values that it represents. And I know we're all very eager now to hear the minister's perspectives of Argentina's international priorities and the many opportunities that lie ahead. So ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to introduce the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Jorge Fowey. A brief remark before starting that I will do this speech in Spanish, but nevertheless, I would like to compliment Madame Albright. It's an honor for all of us, all the Argentinians, to have her here in Buenos Aires. As a diplomat, a career diplomat, as you have mentioned, we do appreciate the role you play so actively when you were the Foreign Minister of the United States. It's a relevant time of discussion. Uh, it was a time of setting a new path to the world at the time, and you were very forceful in doing so, and we all reckon the role you play so clearly uh, and outspoken during the time you were there. You are a sort of uh, reference to everybody who wants to be, uh, like me, a minor Minister of Foreign Affairs. But you also made a, re a reference yourself about the fact of uh, this 
word that I like very, very much, Atlantic, because uh, I think that we have to keep in mind the Atlantic factor that somehow, some way in this late decade has been a little bit discussed too much. And, well, I'm not that clear if I can put that on, on the United States, but certainly in the Latin American countries, as it is for the European countries, we should think a lot about how we keep value of the Atlantic. Is our common water, is the link that refers, and it has been the cradle, as you well put forward during your years, the cradle of the, these last five centuries of the human mankind and the progress around the world. So please, let us no, do not kill yet so quickly the Atlantic. So you being in charge of the Atlantic Council, we should deal a lot more with the idea of why we do need to keep the Atlantic alive. Me pidieron que I was requested to contribute to the closing of this event by the Atlantic Council here in Buenos Aires, which is a very good time, very timely. They were mentioning the the director was mentioning the, their support to the reforms undertaken by the Argentine government. It is a valuable support. From the perspective of our foreign policy, it is a moment of change and changes that allow us to be very attentive, all of us in Argentina, and in particular, those that are of us working in foreign policies, to pay a lot of attention to the changes and the dynamics that the international scenario is having currently. This transformation of Argentina that was mentioned as a continuous reformism is not happening in a vacuum. It is happening in a context, a context that is at the same time, for some actors, somehow restless because the rules of the games are changing. There is a relative uncertainty towards, uh, in relation to towards where aiming to, and there are things that happened in, like in these few days, some reactions that keep us wonder what will be the sense for the short and medium terms. For us Argentinians, coming with our history, I will refer to later, this is an opportunity. It is a clear opportunity to have a relevant role. Some would call it protagonic role, but we want to have a role in the participation. We have found the time, the moment, the leadership of President Macri that is at the right time to work with a vision that is possible as from Latin America, as from the South of America towards the world. The decade that passed was very much about the financial crisis of 2008 that impacted basically in the financial economic order out of Bretton Woods in the 40s and 50s, and which had a, an important impact equivalent to what it was, the economic crisis of 1929-1930s. But we had the tools like G20 that allowed us to attenuate the impact, but do not resolve it fully. In this past decade, all countries, I believe, and in particular countries in Latin America, we have had proof that poverty decreased in many countries in the region, Argentina itself, but also Brazil, Arge Bolivia, other countries, poverty decreased. But at the same time, there was an extraordinary increase of the distribution of wealth and patterns of inequality were established that make us Argentines with the resources we have, natural human resources, still have 28% poverty rate even when we were able to reduce it by four points in the last year. We, in this context of coming out of a terrible uh, financial 
crisis. We are now in this second decade in a technological transformative revolution that changes all production mechanisms. The impact of this on the labor forces and the feasibility and new productive realities that are frankly truly transformative. It is a new element that we need to add to our analysis of where are we Argentines standing, not only us, but the rest of the world in this moment of important changes. At the same time, we undergo this process of migration currents that have moved and impacted incredibly other regions that not particularly the south of Latin America, but decisively Central America, moving towards the US, impacting migration currents with conflicts in the Middle East and the incidents it has on the European nations, which were concerned about the migration coming from the north of Africa for economic and social reasons there that has to do with conflict and lack of opportunities, work, and lack of insertion in their own countries with their own populations. All these of migration currents that take the Holy Father to come up with gestures of saying, we are having a problem with this. A lot of people are dying on the Mediterranean. They're trying to leave the Middle East and reach Europe. All this generates in those seeing the impact of technologies in work, they say, I am losing my source of work. Where will I live if I don't work with this right now? We have this anguish. and. We see the people coming from other continents which are not able to fully integrate in the new country, in the hosting country. The receiving country feels threatened. I cannot spare the few work, jobs that I have from, to others coming from outside the Europe. But this is not the only aspect. Uh, uh, these communicational aspects that we see about the meaning of migrations in Europe, we see uh, this phenomena also in Asia with connotations related to national identities and religious identities of the peoples with extraordinary numbers, as it was mentioned by Pope Francis visiting Bangladesh, mentioning the Rohingya migration problems in the region. All these elements, uh, as we would say inside a cocktail shaker create this uh, sensation of uncertainty and lack of security, but also create a questioning of the ideas as to where should mankind be heading for. And in this questioning, we're questioning globalization. We question the idea of having a greater, not only a commercial exchange, but an exchange of IT networks or interaction created by technological media. And they are also uh, questioning the political systems because based on certain crises of demand, certain countries from Europe have reacted differently. Or even in our own region, what is the degree of traditional answers, the one that prevailed out of two majorities of bipartisan systems, all the parties that uh, we are more used to in Latin America, how do they react uh, to this kind of atom in which you have neutrons and positrons trying to define a new reality. Well, in certain areas, the political systems uh, were able to hold this uh, crisis, but by questioning the leaderships. In some other cases, they question the political system as we know it, and we have parties that are historically traditional. Let's take an example, France, in which the two uh, well-known parties that were there from before the Second World War sharing the direction of France are replaced by a new emerging force. And this has also been the case of Spain. It has also happened here in Argentina. So this phenomena of everything that has happened to us indicates the 
appearance of new forces that act within the economic and political system and they force us to readapt or to do this permanent reformism. I believe that all these experiences are the scenario in which Argentina appears once again in the international arena. Argentinians were always prone to the international arena. Many times they admired us and they questioned us and they said, OK, what are your degrees? And uh, we always used this extra mile because we had this extra condition of feeling certain uh, secure of certain things. But in the last 12 years, we disappeared from the international arena. And the world was asking, where did Argentinian people go? What are they doing? And the truth is that we had a period in which we were locked down and we created within our own society a model of confrontations. And what did this leave us ultimately? Well, obviously, we remain more isolated. We had a process of impoverishing because when we had the time of boosting in order to be able to participate from the discussion and the distribution of natural enrichment in terms of commerce and access to investments, well, we were included a special model almost as in Albania of living within our limits. And we were more poor. We were. Uh, relate technologically and we were not attached to the world and with a very uh, particular technical divide. This is why President Macri, when he was inaugurated in December, uh, he said, OK, let's re be reinserted to the world and let's do so fast and in an intelligent way. This is why we are saying that Argentina, in its foreign policy, is inserting itself intelligently. So we are trying to reconnect with the main currents of the world to the main countries that are our partners to the destination markets, but reading at the same time how mankind advances. There are transformational changes that take place in the world, and we need to interpret, to read how Argentina gets inserted along these changes, uh, these currents of changes. In certain stages of our life as a nation, the fact of being so isolated or far away geographically geographically, we are up, down, south, or north, we are far away from the m most important trade currents in mankind. And they still prevail in an east-west or west-east sense, other than in a north-south sense. But now we have a vocation of being involved. And we want to do so in a rational way. We don't want to be trapped by ideologies or speeches. We just want to say, OK, with this country, with this uh, neighboring country, what can I do? How I can do it? What is the benefit for Argentine people? So this is why we have today an intelligence insertion to the world, which translates to uh, a foreign policy that is defined as pragmatic. This pragmatism of a foreign policy does not mean that we do not have values, because Argentina is a society. It is because it's a free society, free from a human point of view, free from a point of view of political freedoms, and free because we defend that each one has a right to have their own ideas and read the newspapers they want and to believe in whatever gods they want to believe, and they need to coexist. And we need to respect the rights. And to coexist, we need to respect the children's rights, the rights of women and f human rights are just a set of rights to all citizens that oblige us to respect the differences and therefore the rights that other peoples have. Argentina is committed with many causes, and these are the ones defended by the international community in the 21st century, that childhood is protected, access to education and health, that women should be acknowledged and recognized with a gender equality, and also other ways of manifesting sexuality should have a right to the identity they want, and that we can all coexist in an harmonic way. At the same time, 
In terms of our economic reality, we recognize that we are a middle development uh, country. We have certain areas in which we are avant-garde. We all know that Argentina, in terms of nuclear and space affairs, has a def developed segments or lines that are of high relevance that compare us to the main powers of the world. And this is why we can sit at some of the clubs that debate this type of issues. At the same time, we know we still have development problems that makes us closer to countries that haven't been able to consolidate all their development. This is why we participate in a series of mechanisms trying to have a universe of coexistence with some kind of rules. Very specifically, the day after tomorrow, we will start with the conference of the WTO. And from this perspective, we're going to say, well, I want more commerce. I want to be able to reach with Argentinians product to the world. And I would like to have this with some kind of access, with some kind of regulation that says, OK, if I have wheat or beef, well, I want to get there. Do not subsidize more than necessary. Let's not spend $500 billion in internal subsidies, and then we give $135 billion to uh, aid development. This is what we want, but we want to have an organization that regulates this to have rules and that these rules are rational. So this is why President Markley said when G20 uh, started, uh, um, but this is not applied strictly to the WTO, but what he said is what we want is to prevail among the countries, the power of the norm. But what we do not want is the norm of power to prevail, because we know we have an intermediate size. And I do not have the market. I do not have the army to develop or to launch a, a rocket or to get make someone uncomfortable. No, I need to work with the rules, with rational rules. And if the rules that exist like the ones we have at the WTO, do not satisfy everyone who's included in the organization. Let's sit together and discuss which should be the rules that exist so that this works for the benefit of everyone, of the large ones and also of the small ones, and above all, of the case of the intermediate countries. We want more multilateralism. We want more trade. And we do not want less trade or less multilateralism. This is why we are at the WTO with a constructive proposition. This is not our agenda. Argentina is not this agenda. It is the agenda of the WTO. They have started debated as of 2002. And like Madman Albright, my experience is very little in the multilateral arena. I work in the bilateral arena. And when I look at the multilateral world, I do, oh, where will this go? But there's something that I wonder under these circumstances. At the WTO, we are discussing all the topics that comes from the Doha round, and then we moving one step forward, another one. And so we achieved certain things at the Nairobi meeting in Bali. We were able to reduce the agricultural subsidy. We were able to get some uh, rules or regulations that facilitate commerce. So at the same time, there's something that's sensible, because this is food and the possibility of growth of developing countries. We cannot overlook that the economic and commercial reality of the world is not essentially in what we are discussing. Because in terms of commerce and the WTO, we are discussing very marginally the commerce of service. Two thirds of the world GDP come from the commerce of services. And we are discussing the barriers, the tariff barriers or the new rules. So we left the tariffs and we decided to reduce the tariffs, but we created this other barrier. So as we are discussing all this, we have the e-commerce, a new reality, then the e-currencies, and they are overcoming us, and they are creating realities at an extraordinary speed. So we set uh, objectives to control certain products, but then we have certain services on the cloud, and they are putting forward the movement of a world richness. And we're not looking at this. So part of this exercise is we need to sit together, all the members of this agreement. And we have to discuss 
concrete realities existing today. Today, Buenos Aires, at the meetings of Buenos Aires, well, this meeting is a place where we can discuss the topics that are in the mandate, fishing, agriculture, commerce, but we also need to start paying attention to these other topics that are there in the universe. But we don't want to touch upon them because we haven't finished with the other ones. And we are aware that the speed of changes is making some of these things overcome ourselves. I think that when I joined this discussion, the concerns of those who were speaking at that point was to achieve from the Argentinian perspective everything that Argentina is requesting from the authorities in terms of modernizing our productive structure. We need to make it more rational. This is why they, I was talking about a constant reform in Argentina. And I think that this is the best way. Uh, because when you change every day, you are being a revolutionary. When you are doing a revolution, you never change. So if you are implementing reforms year after year, I will have a great reform. So as Argentinians, we want more market for our production so as to have a greater scale, so as to be more competitive. And in order to do so, we need investment. And to, to have investment, we need to have rules. We need foreseeable and long-lasting rules. This is why we understand that we need to work associated to a certain set of mechanisms. We are doing it with the WTO, and we are doing from the search of Argentina to enter the OECD. And we have uh, done fantastic work for a year and a half, almost two years, by uh, trying uh, what are the structural reforms that Argentina has been implemented and that uh, we it have has aligned us to what this club of the good practices recommends, and that is the OECD, so that we are aligned to what the world is doing. We are Argentinian people are not trying to reinvent the wheel, but since we have all these rules, let's adapt to the rules so as to have more commerce, more investment, and a better uh, fine-tuning with the relations. We want to institutionalize the changes that we have implemented, and part of this work is done by belonging to this organization. And it is also uh, by means of what we are doing as what we are doing as presidents of the G20. This is a new experience for Argentina. It's the same Argentina that was closed uh, up until three years ago. Today, it's an open Argentina that sits at the table of the G20. And the G20 members, like China and the US, they said, OK, what are you bringing to the table? Why are you here? Well, what we bring here is our reform. And the idea is that the path for the countries is along these structural changes, and that this could be done by great powers like Germany, France, but also by countries like us. And we are doing this aligned to what other countries are doing. And we are giving a perspective from the South together with Brazil, Chile, Mexico. And they are Latin American partners within G20. And what does this perspective consist of? Well, if we have to discuss many topics that are discussed at the G20, well, commerce, well, should we remain isolated or integrated? So we raise the hand and we say it's multilateralism. When it's isolated, then Argentina will bring the recipe of the results. And I've already told you what has happened to us when we went along that path. So this is not just only about commerce. It's about environment. Let's defend the environment. We have to agree how to dampen the impact that we are created on environmental conditions. This is the common home, as they say. So we have to take care of ourselves. It is obvious that we all need to share this bill, and therefore the economic impact that it could have for great powers that could have a greater environmental impact than the one Argentina can create, we need to discuss this with a rational sense, looking forward, because the world we have will end. This is why we're discussing fishing. We are discussing agricultural subsidies, because we are at a home, at a common house, a home, and we all need to get to a consensus where we want to be heading for. And we have to uh, avoid these ideas of conflict. And 
We, this has never helped us. This is why one of the first tasks was to come to an agreement with the neighboring countries, because it's with them that we are sharing out of this home this regional area. And we have moved forward magnificently with Chile, and we have just signed an agreement of economic complementation. It's a free trade area agreement. It's a last generation agreement. And we're also exploring this to, to have signed it with other countries as Peru or Colombia. We have a very intense work to do at a Mercosur level. It's a Mercosur that has boosted, as of Argentina's presidents last year, all the external or the foreign agenda. That is Mercosur, Argentina with its partners. We are having a dialogue with the Pacific Alliance. We are in this uh, possible alliance with the European Union after 22 years of negotiating process, but we also uh, in uh, dial having talks with Japan, with Canada, with the Middle East. We, that is, the world is the scenario in which Mercosur and Argentina within Mercosur bloc and Argentina bilaterally wants to act. I think that Argentina has shown that this dynamism pays. I believe that Argentinians are renowned in something that is a gesture thing, but has extraordinary meaning for everyone. In the disappearance of the San Juan submarine that we're still looking for, the first reactions were of three countries that immediately called our attention because of the generous offer. It was the United States, Great Britain, and Russia. The friendly uh, countries, the neighboring countries, well, they were also the first ones in being there. Chile, Uruguay, Brazil, Peru, Colombia. That is, we had 13 countries that immediately, without us having to look for them, they said, how can we help you? We have the technology you do not have. And this is a proof of the insertion or a proof of the ties that Argentina was able to rebuild and of how Argentinians, the Argentina society was able to understand that in a global world with the dimensions of multilateralism, with the dimensions of the e-commerce, we cannot remain alone, isolated, thinking about our own belly button. We have to work in order to have a vision that indicates belonging, to be inside the world, inserted to the world, so that this allows us to do things as the ones that took place in this uh, search and rescue exercise. The world said, OK, you need help, count on us. This is highly valuable. And this speaks about the recovery of a place, a recovery of leadership. President Macri, undoubtedly, because of how the evolution of the political scenario was, is clearly acknowledged, renowned as the leader that in times in which a, a world has an option of, should I move forward or backwards? No, he said, let's move forward. But not only because of a vocation of his own, but because Argentine people told him, look, Mr. President, I don't know what is the way, but please, let's implement changes. Let's do changes that turns us into a better society so that we can recover the time in which we were fighting ones against others and that how is we were relayed. So we need to have these reforms. We need to be competitive. And we need to be competitive because we need to be productive. And we want to be productive because we want to have jobs. And jobs mean well-being, and they give sense to men and women of what they are in the world, and they allow them to progress. The only reason that all the reforms have, all the reforms of the Macri's administration, is so that Argentina can be better, so that we, Argentine people, can lead better lives, so that we can have a level of well-being, and so that we can make the most, as the parable of talents indicates, everything that was given to the people and the Argentine nations. There are vast natural uh, riches. It's a beautiful country and very valuable people. The best people, Argentine people. Thank you very much, Madam Albright. Thank you so much for the relations 
Minister, to help us close this event. We want to thank everyone, Minister Malcorra, Cabrera, and the relevant presence of Secretary Marlene Norbright here in Argentina. Let me thank my colleagues, Sean Marnon, and everyone in the organization of the event, and Jose Carelli, Marcelo Carmona, and Diana Laruso from Abrazo, which together with its team worked on the logistics of the event. The message from this conference is clear. Argentina has reinserted itself in the world, and the implications for the Argentine people are and will be enormous and positive. And the Atlantic Council is here to support this new path. Our doors in Washington are always open to Argentina. I want to thank the HSBC and all other partners, Becky McKenzie, Cari, Seral Cronista Apertura Info Technology, the AMCHAM uh, in Argentina. I want to close the conference. I want to thank everyone for your presence. Uh, please return your headsets. We'll see you again soon. Thank you.